and welcome to Banfield. It's been seven weeks since 900 workers at the online mortgage site Better.com joined a Zoom call with their CEO only to learn that they were being let go right there on the spot. If you're on this call, you are part of the unlucky group being laid off. Your employment here is terminated effective immediately. The timing of that announcement, just you know, weeks before Christmas, made the shock of it that much worse. And it was a shock. The workers had no advance notice. If you don't count the CEO's history of, shall we say, tough love, in 2020, he informed his employees via an email, and I'm quoting him here, you are too damn slow. You're a bunch of dumb dolphins, and dumb dolphins get caught in nets and eaten by sharks. So stop it. Stop it. Stop it right now. You're embarrassing me. Notice the all caps. Ah. The man's name is Vishal Garg, and he's Better.com's co-founder in addition to CEO. After the mass firings, and a few resignations in protest, the company's board announced that Garg, too, needed some time away. And away he went. And while we have no idea how many of the 900 workers he fired in December have since found new jobs, tonight we know this. Vishal Garg has his job still. Or should I say again? The board says Garg used his time off to, quote, reflect on his leadership, reconnect with company values, and work closely with an executive coach. Well, that's nice. Uh, for his part, the CEO, who once called his workers dumb dolphins, now says this. I'll quote him. Uh, I understand how hard these past few weeks have been. I am deeply sorry for the angst, distraction, and embarrassment my actions have caused. I've spent a lot of time thinking about where we are as a company and the type of leadership better needs and the leader I want to be. I should note that while Garg was gone, the company underwent a review of its culture carried out by a former federal prosecutor. And changes are coming, including a brand new chief human resources officer. And now we're talking my first guest's language. Andy Challenger is a senior VP of the outplacement firm Challenger Gray and Christmas. Among their specialties is helping companies lay off people the right way. So Andy, before I go on, I just want to uh, replay that layoff announcement because actually somebody captured it on video while watching from home. Take a look. If you're on this call, you are part of the unlucky group you, dude. that is being laid off. Your employment here is terminated effective immediately. Are you kidding me? I think that would have been my reaction as well. And but you know, with your exhale, the question is perfect for you. Have you ever seen anything handled worse? Uh, I don't think I've seen it handled worse, at least with this many people. Although I got to say, it's not the most uncommon thing for people to mishandle uh, a large layoff like this, right? It is, it's difficult for all the people that are being let go. It's also difficult for the people that are doing it. And a lot of people run away from it and do something like this, where they do a mass firing online. Uh, that's something we're seeing a little bit more during COVID, uh, but always the wrong way to go about it. Uh, if in any way possible, you're trying to acknowledge that people have given part of their life to your company, they've worked hard for you and that you really respect them even if the job is going away. So Vishal Garg got his job back. He's, you know, in the top seat. And all I keep thinking is this is a uh, worker's market. You know, uh, there are people like heading for the hills all the time and finding employees is really hard. How on earth does this company recruit when that stuff kind of lives online forever? Yeah, it's a, a little surprising that he kept his job as a leader of the organization after such an error at a time when companies don't have the luxury of uh, some bad PR, a news cycle or two uh, covering how poorly the company treated employees in this environment where it's a massive labor shortage. It's so difficult for companies to bring on and retain people uh, that it is a little surprising he was brought back into the role. 
Okay, so he's apparently reflecting and he's like reconnecting and working closely with the executive coach and all the rest, which I think is great. Uh, I'm all for redemption. It's just that yes. the, that after the the firing and then all the backlash, right? That so the video plays, everybody goes nuts, and social media goes bananas. And then Vishal Garg himself uh, went after everybody on social media, and he wrote this: "You guys know that at least 250 people of the people terminated were working an average of two hours a day while clocking eight hours plus a day in the payroll system they were stealing from you and stealing from our customers who pay the bills that pay our bills get educated so okay i i, I really want to play devil's advocate here i get yeah. it uh he's mad right because he fired a bunch of people that he says were really costing the uh, the company and costing the good workers um but there isn't there a way i mean it, how do you work for a boss that does does it that way, even if he's right? Yeah, I think it's like, important to acknowledge maybe a kernel of truth that people in some cases have been less productive uh, working over, over at home over the last year and a half. But the low emotional intelligence that he showed in the way he described that, the way he talked about it as stealing, um, it was so counterproductive to what a CEO should be doing in that position. Uh, so it, it's pretty unjustifiable, even, even if the, there is a kernel of truth. Okay, so here's the good side of Vishal Gar, because I know everybody's piled on like, you know, crazy. Back in 2019, he actually told the story of how he launched better.com and why he launched better.com. And, and I saw a whole other side of this guy. So I want to play that. Take a look. I started this company because I was I was perfectly happy. I was on 57th and Park and trading mortgage-backed securities and you know it did, <laughs> making spreadsheets compete against other spreadsheets. But uh, I went to go get a mortgage myself. I was like, this is horrendous. How bad is this process? And we ultimately Careful. ended up losing the apartment that we were going to buy for ourselves uh, to an all-cash bid because our mortgage company couldn't show up on time. I was like, if it's so bad for me, like a you know professional in Manhattan, how bad is it for everyone else? Okay, uh, Andy, that sounds like a guy who's on my side. I could really get behind someone like that, and I could certainly buy that product that, that he's selling because he's lived it, you know, it's his life experience. And there's a passion behind it, and it's, you know, authentic. At the same time, I keep wondering, is he an exception to the rule, or is he the norm for CEOs who are just mad when they're taken advantage of? I mean, he's definitely not the exception to the rule in terms of being taken advantage. Of course, that's going to upset everybody. I think some of what uh, makes this so distasteful, though, is the two-facedness of it, is that you see him there and it's so, he's so on your side. But then when you see kind of the dirty laundry inside the company, how people were treated, the way he you know, called them dumb dolphins early at the top of the set, uh, it's just not the way you treat people. It's not the way you treat employees who uh, give their hard work and time to you. Yeah, it's the, it's the messaging, right? It's always the messaging. Andy Challenger, thank you. It's great to see you. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me. So right now, uh, two thirds of us, give or take, uh, who are in so-called white collar jobs, we are working remotely from home, at least part of the week anyway. But this time a year ago, it was eight out of 10 of us, which is a lot, you know? And yeah, you can work in your jammies and no, you don't have to deal with that gum popping mouth breather in the cubicle next door, unless that person is your spouse. Uh, but there are some facts here that are really interesting. 91% of people who work at least some of their hours remotely, well, they hope to still be able to do that after the pandemic. That's according to Gallup. Three out of 10 say that they are extremely likely to change jobs if they cannot re uh, work remotely. That's really interesting. So what really goes on in home offices all across America? Here's where it gets super duper interesting. A company called HighSpeedInternet.com commissioned a survey that found 71% of remote workers have done just what I said, worked or attended meetings in their jammies, present company, company in, uh, included, I'll admit that. Um, half said that they've worked while using the toilet. <laughs> Others aren't so industrious. 51% say that they have spent most of their workday streaming TV uh, or movies. 54% say playing video games. I wanna bring in 
Trevor Wheelwright, who wrote up these findings and titled the story, The Expected, The Bad, and The Naughty. I actually really like the way you titled that. Okay, so Trevor, let's talk about The Unexpected. What out of the survey really surprised you? Uh, you know, there was definitely a lot that wasn't surprising. I think it's really easy to think that working from home is like just fun and you know, you can just sit there and crank stuff out. But the reality is a lot more like getting distracted. Um, I mean, it's maybe halfway surprising, but about 30% of people are mostly distracted by food. So just snacking and stuff. So, you know, if you get an office rolling, the snack thing can maybe pull people away. But uh, yeah, working from home, I think, uh, kind of the most surprising things are maybe some of the more individual answers we got, like mining cryptocurrency or, you know, the, <laughs> playing the video games. That one kind of gets me some Call of Duty answers. Hey, Trevor, I'm, I'm going to tell you right up. I didn't take your survey, but I did gain 10 pounds because of that refrigerator distraction. So I completely <laughs> identify with all the people who did answer that question. 77% of your respondents said that they check their social media or they shop online while uh, they're working. And here's what I think. I think that's really low because I've done stories over the past many years uh, where people do this ad work with everybody looking. Aren't you, aren't you a little surprised that it's not 100%? Yeah, you know, I mean, it is a survey, so you got to take what people are expressing about their own work situations with a grain of salt. But yeah, you know, I think it's uh, not the worst thing in the world to sit there and in between meetings or anything, sit there and check stuff. Um, and I think in a, a lot of us in these quote unquote white collar jobs, you know, do kind of need distractions. There's a lot of creative work go that goes into it, a lot of brain power that needs to, you know, happen. So I think a lot of it's really more so people needing that break away from work. And now that they have the opportunity to do some other things that aren't necessarily just office chatting or, you know, taking a walk around the office or whatever. Um, you know, I think people are just kind of taking those opportunities and it's probably not as uh, distracting as, it might seem compared to what actually happens in the office and those distractions, you know, you're talking about no noisy neighbors and chew pop and bubble gum and all that. That's worse for me. Yeah. So. Is it, well, it, you know what? I miss it. I kind of miss that. I do miss my friends at the office. Okay, a couple of other amazing statistics I love. 53% of your respondents <laughs> have added a fake meeting to their calendar. <laughs> so that they can have a break. And of course, you know, if you're in the office, everyone's going to know, yeah, you're not at a meeting. I love that 50% of them have faked bad internet so that they either uh, don't actually have to attend the meeting or actually just turn off their camera. But what I thought about when I saw those stats was, well, are those the kind of people that, you know, Vishal Gart was talking about? They're, they're lazy and they don't want to, you know, give 100%. Yeah, you know, I think it's, it's kind of interesting to think about the difference between somebody being productive in office versus at home and questioning whether or not are we really being that productive in the office, you know, comparatively anyway. So that might have to be the next survey we run. Um, but yeah, you know, when it comes to like what he did, that's that's a little ice cold. And I do think if you have good workers and you're paying them well and giving them proper benefits and everything, they'll be happy to sit there and work for you. They might not need the full eight hours of the day and you might not be able to squeeze that out of them anyway. So I say it's probably better to just let your workers be happy and stay productive in that way rather than, you know, sit there and hold them to a, a firm time schedule, you know? Yeah, let me let me break from your survey for a second and I'm going to do my entirely unscientific survey on my Instagram, which I launched right before the show. And I have a couple of like answers I just want to quickly read to you. Nina B. Clark said, my kids and my dog. It's the most distracting. Uh, Pamela Kiernan said, the kitchen. That I expected. Um, I like this one. A.S. Dubuque said, TikTok reels. That's what that's what that person spends time doing. And Isa LaBella Studio says, laundry. And I have that problem. I have to get the laundry. Yeah. I have to admit it. Um, and then I've got someone else who says the dog, someone else who says Bam Bam the Frenchie, and I've got Atlas. He will not stop going in and out of the house, and I have to stop what I'm doing all the time. This one was cool. 61% said that they've spent the majority of a video call staring at themselves. Is that because it's just such a weird dynamic, or is there something I should read into that that they're, you know, they're not paying attention. If they're staring just at themselves, they're not getting the verbal language of the other talker. 
Yeah, yeah. I think there's a lot to be said about these sort of Zoom calls and everything. I mean, I could just sit here and be staring at myself, maybe in some narcissism or something. But, you know, I think a lot of it's just kind of like getting stuck at home and not really uh, knowing quite like what to do with yourself sometimes while you're just kind of listening to somebody droning on. You don't have their presence that you would in the office. So, yeah, I think it's pretty easy to just sit there and zoom into your Zoom just on yourself, you know? <laughs> Yeah, it's a bit, it's a weird dynamic. Okay, unless you work on TV like I do, I'm used to seeing myself in a monitor, so I don't think the Zoom is interesting. A couple, I'm just going to read off a few more because I do think they're super interesting. Uh, these run counter to the Gallup poll that we ran earlier. 77% have felt unproductive while working from home. Interesting. 75% say that they have struggled to maintain their work life balance. So clearly we've got some uh, some room to grow in the work from home environment. But Trevor Wheelwright, thank you for being with us. I appreciate it. That was a really good survey you guys did. Appreciate y'all. Take it easy. You take it easy too. Okay, before we move on, I do want to hear from all of you who are remote workers. If you're watching News Nation right now, what is your single biggest distraction when you're trying to focus on business? Uh, I just read some of my Insta followers, but you can hit me up on Twitter. Um, at Banfield on NN, that's the Banfield on News Nation. Uh, you can go to our Facebook page, Banfield on News Nation. Uh, you can get me on my personal Facebook and Insta at Ashley Banfield. And I'm going to read a whole bunch more of your answers a little later on in the program. California plastic surgeon George Sander Sanders tells uh, NewBeauty.com, many women who have undergone breast augmentation surgery in the past are opting for an exchange for smaller implants or no implants. That is an interesting observation because it seems to contradict the actual financial numbers. According to the Aesthetic Society, Americans spent $9 billion on plastic surgery in 2020, despite a two-month shutdown because of COVID. And the experts say when the numbers from 2021 come in, they're going to be even higher. One surgeon told Allure magazine, we are in the heyday of plastic surgery. So my question is, which is it? Are we in the middle of a plastic surgery boom? Or is it all about undoing the procedures that you regret from years past? I am joined by Dr. Michelle Henry. She is a surgeon who specializes in skin cancer, hair restoration, cosmetic procedures, and advanced laser surgery. All right, doc, I am so glad you're here. I keep wondering if that boom in all the plastic surgery numbers is actually people going in to the surgeon to take out what they've got and reverse what they did. Am I wrong? So it's a combination of many things. So just as there are trends in fashion, there are trends in beauty. And there's an overall trend to having a more natural appearance. But natural doesn't mean you remove everything. So the beauty in a lot of what we do is that we can reverse it. We can modify it. So a lot of my patients are looking to look like themselves just a little bit better. So they may remove a little bit of filler. If they've had years gone by, they just want a little bit of a boost. And the same happens on the body. So absolutely, I'm hearing patients coming in talking about explantation, so removing their implants, but not to get rid of them completely, sometimes for a smaller profile. They want more of a natural aesthetic, and that is definitely a trend that we're seeing. I mean, I love the, I love the idea that we want to look natural, but I'm always curious about trends in body shape. I am old enough to have lived through a bit of the whole twiggy part of life where all of a yeah. sudden everybody decided to get super skinny in the 70s. And then I'm now old enough to see the boomerang to Kim Kardashian, which is get your badonkadonk going, you know. So are we seeing another shift in the trends? Because some of the younger producers on my staff actually said it's going back towards Kate Moss and low rise pants. P.S. I haven't even bought the high rise pants yet. But where are we with the, <laughs> the, 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 the body look? Like, where is the fashion? I personally hope low rise does not come back, but I think we are coming to to what I think kind of a midpoint to to a midpoint. You know, it is that more natural aesthetic. Women still want their curves, but they just don't want the exaggerated curves. They want something that's more within the parameters of a natural body. Um, so I still have women that may want a little bit of buttock augmentation, but it's not exaggerated. They want something mm -hmm. again, both on the face and the body. It's them, but just a little bit better. So it's more a correction okay. of areas that they may have a little bit of a deficit. All right, so Dr. Henry, here's the rapid fire from our viewers. We asked our News Nation mm -hmm. viewers, okay, we got Dr. Michelle Henry on, and they went nuts, and, yes. and they're excited. So here are the questions we're going to do rapid fire. First one comes and says, mm -hmm. how do you know if your doctor's good? 
So word of mouth is the best way to find out if your doctor's good. Talk to other doctors. Talk to your friends. People are more open now. And look on their national sites. So for dermatologists, the American Academy of Dermatology, for plastic surgeons, the American Society of Plastic Surgeons, those are good places to start. Okay, next one comes to us from Aaron. Is getting fillers injections as a preventative before much visible aging is showing a waste of money or a good idea? It's a great question. I think this is an excellent idea. So I subscribe to the belief that a little bit over a longer period of time is more natural than having a lot later on. And so you know, what are wrinkles? They're really the wear and tear over time and it's cumulative. So if you stop them early, you never get the deeper folds. You never need the multiple syringes. So that's how I, I treat my patients and after a decade of treating them, it works. Okay, uh, this one says, do you recommend anything non-surgical medical for prevention of skin aging besides avoiding the sun? Um, and then they parentheses say <laughs> food products, vitamins, etc. So absolutely, I definitely take a holistic approach. So sunscreen, of course, is important, but also your antioxidants. We talk a lot about vitamin C. That's going to be a part of your environmental shield to protect your skin from all of those reactive oxygen species po poking holes in your collagen. Your diet is important. A lot of it starts from the inside out. So hydration, those foods with healthy fats, salmon, avocado, walnut, that's going to protect your skin. It's going to protect your collagen. Working out, making sure that you're not having those like, sweets, those sweets, anything that spikes your insulin is going to cause your skin to have more inflammation. So there's a Stop. lot you can do, but not forgetting don't, the inside. No, no, Critical. don't say no sweets. That's <laughs> killing me. Okay, I'm wait. Sorry, this next I'm one, sorry. it's my last one. It's from Dave. I love that it comes from a guy. Dave says, are there any plastic mm -hmm. surgeons who will tell a patient enough is enough and refuse a job? all of the good ones. So I always tell my patients mm -hmm. what I do is as important as what I don't do. And what you're paying me for is not just my technique, but also my discretion. And so almost every day I'm telling a patient, stay within the guardrails. This is what we should do. This is what you shouldn't do. And this is how this will age. So it's our job to make sure that we're preparing them for the future. So any great plastic surgeon or dermatologist will tell you what you should not do. So that's absolutely critical. And you're one of the good ones. Dr. Michelle Henry, thank you so much. Thank really you. appreciate it. Will you come back again? Thank you. I would love to. Thank you for having me. Joining me now to, I don't know, dissect? Carrie Kasem. Her father, Casey Kasem, was a famous national radio host under conservatorship for the last part of his life. Her new Audible series is called Bitter Blood, Kasem versus Kasem. And Susan Filan is an attorney, legal commentator, and former Connecticut prosecutor. Welcome to you both, and thank you. Susan, I'm going to start with you on the legal front. You can't just tell someone to stop talking or writing about someone famous. So what do you think that cease and desist business is all about? Well, actually, you can tell someone to stop talking. It's not going to work. There's no legal weight behind it. But you can certainly say to somebody, please stop talking. When she goes on to use the word defamation, defamation is a legal word that means that you are defaming somebody, you're injuring them, their reputation. But she's a public figure, so people have a right to talk about her. In order for it to be defamation, it has to be false. Can you imagine, Ashley, that trial? Brittany trying to prove that everything that her sister is saying is actually factually false. That would be some trial. And it would put her in peril. It would be a terrible yeah. move, and I don't think that would happen. I mean, it, it all just sounds like saber rattling to me. Um, so, Carrie, I want to uh, ask you something based on what I'm starting to see on Brittany's feed. And I'm sure if you follow Brittany's feed, you just see sycophantic fans who just call her queen and say she's the best, even when she does very unusual things. But that is starting to change. And I want to read a couple of uh, quotes from some followers. Um, here's the first one. Unpopular opinion. Britney Spears is a mess and really and needs real help. Uh, still, her daddy may have been benefiting from holding the keys to her conservatorship, but y'all gonna be culpable when someone else fleeces her for everything and she ends up even more messed up or dead. Another quote, it's obvious Britney needs help, but it doesn't fit the Yas Queen go off narrative. So and the third one I have here, everyone talking about her freedom, no one's noticing how incoherent the whole text is. If I have a friend sister sending me a message like that, her freedom isn't the first thing I think about, just saying. So, Carrie, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about this whole notion that the Free Bit Britney um, movement, uh, they didn't know her. They didn't know anything about her, and a lot of them glommed onto something for fun. Is it possible that the person we're seeing now is the person who may have been uh, kept from, from a grave danger to herself by that conservatorship, by that father, and she may be backsliding? 
Well, this is this is what I I say about conservatorships and guardianships. They need reform. Uh, it doesn't matter if you've had a mental breakdown, a physical breakdown, if you're elderly, if you're vulnerable, uh, w whatever age you are. If something happens to you and you need help, you don't take away somebody's civil rights and human rights. You don't lock them up for 13 years. You don't take all their money. You don't make decisions on their behalf. That is a jail sentence for anybody. Brittany may need help. But what they did to her in 13 years, the over-medicating is absolutely abhorrent. What I am hearing, the spying on, uh, everything that goes on, that the last eight years that I've been trying to get people out of guardianships, work on bills to curb this type of abuse, it's, it's horrific. So just because somebody needs help doesn't mean you take everything from them. I see what you're saying. I mean, that makes perfect sense. It just, it's so distressing to see her feed and susan i know that there's just nothing you can do if, if someone's troubled it's they're, they're troubled but i just can't imagine there's anybody else out there and i've only got about 10 seconds who would jump in and say i'll do this i'll, I'll do a, a conservatorship it doesn't rise to the level of conservatorship yeah. legally i mean she's not a danger to herself or her others and whether she's going a little bit off or people's opinion of what she's saying is that you know she sounds a little nuts doesn't rise to the level of conservatorship yeah Susan File and Carrie Kasem, thank you both. So appreciate it. Be sure to check out uh, Bitter Blood, Kasem versus Kasem on Audible. Uh, thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.